it was a, a very insightful uh, opportunity to explore that. Uh, as we know, a lot of people say, well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Um, and I always wonder what that means. And uh, maybe at another time we can, uh, we can get you to uh, help explore that with us again. In any event, um, I'd like to uh, just ask you to give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Ruparel, and we'll begin our program. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here um, as the Interfaith Scholar in Residence this year. Um, as uh, Rabbi mentioned, uh, I was very interested in this program when it first started and um, uh, grew to, well, as soon as I realized what it was, I thought, gosh, this is probably, uh, one, it's incredibly unique, and two, what an amazing program. Um, we really do um, owe a debt of gratitude to Lil Fader for having the uh, foresight to get something like this started and for uh, the synagogue to host it so well over the number of years to have um, somebody from another faith as it were on staff spending a year with a congregation is really um, the ideal I think for interfaith uh, dialogue. I've spent lots of time with interfaith dialogues, and um, as I'm sure many of you have, and they can be kind of superficial things sometimes. We end up speaking to um, people who have already kind of drunk the Kool-Aid. We're all kind of in this together, and sometimes we need to talk to those who aren't there, right? And so um, sometimes the events can be a little bit, um, uh, as I say, a bit superficial or maybe uh, a little bit self-congratulatory, um, and it's possibly because of the structures. We meet for a very brief time. There's lots of introductions to do because everybody's not on the same page. So to have a program where something like this is spread out, spread out over a whole year where people get to know each other and build trust and understand each other in a better way, that's when dialogue can really happen and that's when we can really start to understand each other in different ways. So um, I'm just going to move around, move this around a bit so I can get my notes here as well. Hopefully I don't, doesn't all come crashing down. All this technology is great when it works, isn't it? Okay, so today I want to talk a little bit um, about Kind of the location of dialogue. Where does it happen and how does it affect us? Um, and it will say a little bit about myself, but hopefully not too much. I've already given some indication about um, um, where I'm coming from and my biases and presuppositions in the article for the shofar um, and also into the blurb. So I'm not going to talk too much about myself. If you can indulge me right at the end, I'll explain a little bit about how this material has affected me. So let's just um, let's continue here. We're all hybrids. Right? This is kind of the main point of today's um, discussion. We're all hybrids, some more than others. Right? Humans, I think, are always mixes of various elements and ingredients. Biologically, we share genes from both of our parents' lines. Our personalities are, um, and the various roles we inhabit are the result of an engagement with all the different people and uh, events of our lives. Our stories are a tapestry. We tell about ourselves and the stories that are told about us, necessarily interweaving ourselves with the selves of others. We are irreducible mixtures, hybrids, compounds, blends, masalas, hyphenations, pluralities, composites, fusions. Sometimes we inhabit only one or even a few aspects of this plurality, even sometimes to the point of hiding temporarily the other parts of our um, plurality. But this does not erase the fundamental fact of our hybridity. There's lots of ways to think about hybrids. Metaphors abound. I've already talked about um, tapestries, but um, we can think also about you know, others, a symphony, a salad, a pointillist painting. All of these happily mix up their constituents, 
revealing a tension at the heart wrought by a commitment to being both and rather than either or. And today I want to reflect a little bit on the idea of middles and margins. We all find ourselves in the middle of some groups and the margins of others. We may be even simultaneously in the middle and the margins of the same group in different ways. So in talking about middles and margins, I want to highlight the ways in which we are all hybrids, where we are both something and another thing at the same time. This location, I think, can be a source of really imaginative, playful creativity, and it potentially gives us a ground upon which we might meet our religious neighbors and they can meet us. So I want to give you three general sort of images or models to think about margins and middles. The first two are physical, and the last one is linguistic. Each model illustrates the notion of being simultaneously different and the same. And each shows us ways to understand the process and the results of living interreligiously. So the first one is that of a shoreline. A shoreline is an interesting place. It's actually rather hard to define precisely where a shoreline is, both because it often moves around, but also because the shoreline is ambiguous. A shoreline is defined as where a body of water meets land. But when we observe closely what a shoreline actually looks like, one sees that the actual meeting point of the water and the land is really hard to draw, since there is always some overlap of some kind where both water and land take up the same space. In one sense, a shoreline is neither water nor land, but it might also be described as both water and land. We describe this kind of space as liminal, and scholars have long been interested in this phenomena since lots of interesting things happen in the liminal space. So the liminal marks out the boundaries of an uh, an, an area. It is occupying a space both at or on both sides of a boundary or threshold. Lots of entities can have liminal spaces. Groups, nations, communities, times like eras or epochs, even individuals, all can be said to have a liminal space. In ritual studies, we find that many religious rituals take place in a liminal space. And sometimes these rituals define liminality itself. Rituals like the uh, rituals which mark the passage of people or groups from one stage to another often creates a liminal space, a sacred location, a sacred location inhabited by a person or a group undergoing a transition. Rites of passages such as weddings, funerals, initiations. Um, You see at the bottom there a sacred thread ceremony in Hinduism and a bar mitzvah on the left side. In the midst of these um, spaces, in the midst of these rituals, the uh, people undergoing them are um, placed in a special location or special um, sort of um, uh, space and time. This space and time is particularly productive and unique. In the midst of a bar mitzvah or a sacred thread ceremony, a young man or woman is definitely not on the outside looking in, but rather, um, <clears throat> rather at the very center of the community. Being on the threshold, however, even when we are surrounded by our friends, we are not completely in, nor are we completely out. At the liminal boundary, we are both in and out of a particular space or stage. We're in process. Being in this unique space, the liminal, affords us a unique perspective. We can see or experience our natures differently, and we can understand our group as a group, or the space as a space. For it's only in this marginal place that we can recognize the boundaries of our group and understand them in contrast to other groups. 
Just as fish do not know the nature of water, we generally cannot truly understand the nature of our own contexts and communities until we engage with these other contexts which are not ours. When we're at the boundaries of our communities and our time periods, only then can we see the shape, their particular particularities and their relationships to other spaces and places. And the good thing is that we do so in this liminal space in a relatively safe way. Rather than trying to occupy the space of an entirely other group or, or time period, which may be really kind of impossible, something utterly different from what we know, the liminal gives us the possibility of experiencing this other space, this other way of being, without really leaving our own we can occupy both spaces at the same time. And thus, we experience authentically what the other, or at least partially what the other has to offer, as it were, while we never stop being ourselves. I'll return to this idea of being an other uh, while remaining oneself a little bit later. The second image I want to, uh, sorry, there's an image of more liminal spaces. Uh, dusk, of course, is an obvious time period that's liminal. It's not day or night. Um, liminal spaces can kind of bring the outside in, as the image on the bottom writes. And the threshold where one is sort of halfway in and out, that's again a, a, a liminal space. So the second image I want to show you is that of a banyan tree. Now this is a very fruitful image for Hindus, as we'll show later on this year. Banyans are trees which send down aerial shoots, which root upon touching the ground. These shoots grow to become trunks which support the spread of the banyan. The great banyan in Calcutta's botanical garden covers 14,400 square meters, just about four square acres. That's one tree. The way banyans grow and spread makes them look like a forest. And when you go there, you feel like you're in a forest. You don't really sort of feel like this is all one tree. All of the trunks look rather different. Moreover, the way banyans grow and spread, um, sometimes the initial or the original trunk is no longer identifiable. In fact, over time, the ravages of fire and disease have made parts of this banyan forest dis uh, disappear and then get refilled in by the marginal trees that are still there. The, Cal the Calcutta banyan forest may thus have no center. It's actually a forest that has no middle, only margins, because the margins are always filling things in. But of course, if you look from outside, the forest, of course, has a center. You can look at it from space and you'll see the center. Yet, it's marginal. It's always marginal because of the way banyans grow. All banyans have multiple trunks, and when they grow to the size of forests, it's difficult to experience them as a single tree, even though that's precisely what they are. This multi-centered nature is also illustrative while our experience of the forest and trunks shows a great deal of difference, each trunk looks rather individual, particular, and unique, yet they are all connected by the same life sap. Banyans have the ability to take on the shape and form appropriate to their particular locations and environments. Where it's drier, the forest looks different. Where it's wetter, the banyan takes on a different shape as well. They are particular and uh, they are appropriate to their particular location and environment, yet remain part of a larger whole, a longer lifespan or tradition. The banyan trunks thus act as a kind of double agent, both a tree adapted to its place, yet holding a very different interior. Banyans are transplants that never broke their connection from the mother tree. Metaphors are the final image I want to give you. 
And this is that linguistic model. Now, I apologize, it does get a little bit you know, abstract here, but I think all of us know what metaphors are and how they work, but we sometimes don't think about them very deeply. Metaphors are figures of speech by which we refer to one thing in terms which evince ideas associated with other things. Right? Metaphors are ways by which we creatively think and speak about something through the lens of another thing, or rather refer to one concept by stretching its connotations to overlap with other concepts. Now, this somewhat abstract way of describing the work of metaphor becomes immediately clear when we consider an example. Take Bob Dylan's Chaos is My Friend. Here, Dylan refers in terms uh, sorry, Dylan refers to chaos in terms which bring to mind various aspects of friendship or friend. The metaphor brings together two hitherto unrelated ideas, and through forcing our minds to resolve this peculiar tension in the metaphor, we elicit a new, more friendly association to the idea of chaos, and vice versa. We also understand friendship in a slightly more chaotic way. The metaphor makes us see chaos as something more familiar and trusted, something with which we have a history, a friend. And the twist goes both ways. This metaphor makes friends become slightly more unpredictable and quixotic, inviting us to live less deterministically. Thus, a metaphor refers to one thing in terms and associations which are pulled from another thing. Each pole of the metaphor, each idea of the metaphor, is kind of re-described through the lens of the other pole. Thus, Groucho Marx's wry metaphor, a hospital bed is a parked taxi with the meter running, well describes the resigned anxiety we sometimes feel when we're stuck in a hospital bed. But by the same token, we may now feel like an immobilized patient next time we are stuck in a taxi in the middle of a traffic jam. So metaphors act by forcing us to mutually re-describe their terms. By doing so, each term's associated commonplaces, their connotations, are stretched towards the other, creating an overlap in the space between them. This is the liminal space that interests me and which, I suggest, might help us to think about our engagement with religious others. So sorry about this. It's kind of an odd sort of um, diagram. You've got chaos and friendship, two different ideas. And in a metaphor, those two ideas are brought together, and they kind of interact in a kind of tension with each other. And out of that tension is born the metaphor, chaos is a friend of mine. There's lots of history about how it is that human beings come up with these metaphors. Aristotle, Aristotle thought it was a sign of genius to come up with great metaphors. But more uh, recently, scholars tend to think that metaphors are actually reflective of the way our brains are structured, the way in which we learn anything. It doesn't require genius to come up with metaphors. We do this all the time. To understand something new, we stretch what we know to try to encompass that new thing, that new data. And by doing so, that new data exerts an influence on what we know. It kind of changes the map of our minds. And at the same time, our map has now incorporated new information. And that new information, that new data, is now understood through the tool of that map. So we don't have to be geniuses. We just have to be aware of the metaphors that we use all the time. In fact, a lot of our language is littered with dead metaphors. The, um, if I can point it out, or the, the things that you're sitting on, chairs, have legs, right? But chairs don't have legs. Legs are, belong to you know, animals and humans, right? But we've called those things chair legs for so long that we don't kind of see the tension there anymore. These are called dead metaphors, and that's how we think. That's how we sort of bring together new ideas 
Um, and as you, I'm sure, can start to think about, um, you know, these dead metaphors, you know, not only are sort of, have lost their kind of ability to shock us, but they actually um, still uh, have retained their ability to shape our thinking. Um, when you think about, for instance, the body as a machine, a finely tuned athletic machine, right? Well, that's a metaphor, right? And if you think about bodies as mechanisms, it's going to affect the way you treat disease and health. If you think about bodies not as mechanisms, but as, I don't know, organisms or something else, maybe even social constructs, right? Then you're going to think about health rather differently. So metaphors have this amazing ability to kind of hide themselves in our language, yet at the same time shape the way we think about things. So um, <clears throat> before I delve into what this liminal space entails, I should be clear to say that these overlaps created by metaphors, while they are real, they're op uh, overlapping positions, they are not... Um, they're evanescent, they're not eternal. They change and they grow and they develop. The back and forth, I'm sorry, they are not yet solidified into reality, but rather are sustained through our imaginations. The back and forth movement of our minds, the dialectic between the terms of the metaphor, each being redescribed by the other, creates and sustains this kind of overlapped hybrid position only as a kind of option an imaginable or an imaginative possible new way of thinking or rethinking the poles of the metaphor. So we've got chaos and friendship creating the metaphor, and the red lines kind of show that chaos doesn't lose its connotations, its original connotations, nor does friendship really do that. But the green lines kind of illustrate how chaos affects our notion of friendship or friend affects our notion of chaos, right? They get re-described or rethought. So returning to the Dylan's example, the um, liminal metaphor, friendly chaos or chaotic friends, each presents new possible ways for us to think about particular aspects of friendship or chaos. The metaphor doesn't so much create a new kind of friend so much as it affords us a new perspective or insight into an aspect of friendship. This is important because the poles of the metaphor remain themselves. They are not forcibly syncretized. Metaphorical hybridity is thus a fluid and dynamic process. It's not a process of forcible conversion. It is sustained by the power of the metaphor to elicit imaginative, creative redescriptions. But it doesn't force its parents to cease to be themselves rather than an actual amalgam between, say, an apple and a pear, a liminal dynamic hybrid is thus more like a new option for thinking or living, although apple pears are quite delicious. Um, these creative, exciting new options might be helpful for us to try to understand how we engage with worldviews or religions very different from ours. So let's move back to this religious idea You've got this chaos and friendship, and in between you've got a kind of metaphor. But you might also have a tradition on one side, a tradition on the other, and some kind of hybrid new tradition. And what I'm trying to say is that this hybrid new tradition is not merely a kind of syncretized squashing together of these two things, right? creating some sort of new tradition out of them. That does happen sometimes, but it doesn't have to as a model for thinking about and engaging with other people and other traditions, we might think of this hybrid new tradition as a kind of new possibility, an imaginative possible world, a way of thinking, something that allows us to get a glimpse into another way, another tradition, yet not really leave our own. Even the hybrid new tradition is still part of the, uh, its parent traditions. <clears throat> One example I want to give you here is that um, of John Donne's poem, um, this overlapping multiple kind of uh, ability for us to be part of different traditions 
in the lives of different people, in the stories of different groups, um, allows us to understand the lines, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. As you know, we're all social creatures. We're never really totally individual. In that sense, we're always already hybrid. And to think about our hybridity through these models of the banyan or of the shoreline or of metaphor allows us to kind of tease out just how we are hybrid. Now, I am, through no doing of my own, very familiar with this process. I am a first-generation immigrant to Canada with ancestry from Western India via East Africa. Growing up in Canada, I was thrust into an unfamiliar environment and have been hybridized by it. I live in the middle of two very different ways of being, Indian, Hindu, Gujarati-speaking, historically colonized immigrant on one side, and on the other, Canadian, largely Christian, English-speaking, historically colonizer, non-immigrant. I have learned to live as a hybrid, equally Canadian, equally Indian, not a hyphenated Indo-Canadian. Those hyphens always raise the question of which term goes first and last second, which one is the adjective and which one is the noun, but equally both Indian and Canadian. While being a hybrid can be a problematic uh, can be very problematic and certainly not always comfortable. It has the signal virtue of being relatively uh, resistant to ossification, relatively resistant to univer universalization and triumphalism. A hybrid liminal identity is a good corrective for black and white us-them judgment. It reminds us of our fallibility and the always tentative foundations of our so-called certainties. It enforces a kind of humility. Oops, sorry. One does not need to be an immigrant to be hybridized. We are all hybrids already. By consciously stretching and redescribing our own identities through careful, respectful, and imaginative liminal engagement with the other, we can use this hybridity to understand and be understood by our religious neighbors and hopefully our friends. Thanks. So, um, as I've said, we've got um, uh, the self and the other. In the middle, we have a hybrid. And for our purposes in thinking about Hinduism, um, we can sort of imagine, that's why I pointed to the next slide, which isn't there. Um, let's imagine this is Hinduism and Judaism. Uh, what I'm suggesting as a good way to do interreligious dialogue is to consciously place ourselves into a kind of liminal position. Now, that liminal position might actually be amenable to hybridization. And we see in many traditions we've got um, uh, Hindu Buddhists, uh, Buddhist Christians, Hindu Christians, uh, Jewish Buddhists, uh, Hindu Buddhists. There's lots of, lo uh, lots of different kinds of, of hybrids available. And as people become hybridized in that way, um, the more they, uh, or sorry, the more people who take that option, the kind of more real that tradition becomes. But as I said, I don't want to focus on the creation of new traditions. Rather, I want to focus on the possibility of uh, new imaginative possibilities, new ways of thinking. And so by liminal, or by, by making, a, I'm sorry, by consciously putting ourselves on the margins of things, we not only get to see our own traditions in a new way, in a different way, we see the boundaries, we see their kind of um, surfaces. Um, we also gain this new perspective. We're able to engage with people from other traditions in a way which is kind of risky. It allows us to stay within our tradition, but it gives us the opportunity to imagine ourselves in a fundamentally different way. 
imagine ourselves in a fundamentally different way. We stay, oursel we stay ourselves, but we become a slightly different flavor of ourselves, a slightly different version of ourselves. Now, why would that be really useful or interesting in dialogue? Well, it's because often we're speaking to people who are very different from ourselves. And Hinduism and Judaism, while they do share lots of interesting similarities, are very different from each other. Um, I think last year you might have had a Buddhist uh, as the scholar. Again, two very different traditions, right? Buddhism is quite unique in many ways, very different from lots of other things. But for Hinduism and Judaism, we've got two um, uh, traditions very different that just happen to have some shared characteristics. And so <clears throat> being consciously liminal allows us to experience ourselves through the kind of metaphorical redescription of the other. We then see the world differently. We become renewed in our own tradition. It doesn't mean that you have to be a Hindu Jew or a Jewish Hindu. You can just see the traditions uh, slightly differently. So I hope that allays any fears of syncretism. That's usually the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> That's usually the worry that people bring about um, in this context, in this issue. <clears throat> you don't really lose yourself. You kind of become a different option, a different version of yourself. And to finish, I want to give you a slightly challenging possibility. Now, if you can become a slightly different version of yourself, not only are you giving yourself a kind of new opportunity, but your life and your identity is always public. It's always something that other people can see, and other people might actually recognize something in this new identity that is attractive to them. Now, I think this might give us a way for us to speak to people who are not here. As I said earlier, lots of dialogue are, lots of interreligious dialogues are characterized by Everybody is already, you know, um, positive towards this stuff. They want to learn. They want to, uh, you know, maybe um, gain wisdom from other traditions. They're already kind of, it's kind of like preaching to the choir, right? It's already there. So the really important part of interreligious dialogue is to try to reach out to those people who aren't here, who actually may be reluctant to even consider this sort of thing. Now let's imagine that those people are not only reluctant, they're consciously uh, antipathetic to anything like this. They don't like us. They might actually want to harm us. How is it in our day and age that religions might form a bridge to speak to the terrorist? How is it that interreligious dialogue might be used to give us tools to speak to those people who aren't here, who don't want to be here, and wish to do us harm? Those, that's the really important question for today. It's really nice to be among people who are of a similar mind, but if we're going to move forward in society, we need to speak to people who are very different and are really kind of angry with us. So here's one way I think we might do this, and it is risky and it's somewhat radical. Why don't we try to understand the traditions of those people who are outside, who don't want to be here, who wish to harm us? And if we are brave enough, could we imagine ourselves being somewhat affected or hybridized by those traditions? Now, of course, they're not here to dialogue with us and give us their kind of authentic view. So we have to do the job, we have to do the homework to try to understand their tradition and their history and their identities as well as we can. And if we can do that, then again, we might be able to see ourselves through their eyes. We might be able to see ourselves and the world through a perspective that for many of us seems abhorrent. If we don't do this, what do we have left? If we don't do this, surely it's always kind of a confrontation. 
and any kinds of agreement are always really, really hard won. If we do do this, if we put ourselves in the liminal position so that we allow ourselves, we sacrifice ourselves to be partially recreated through the terrorist's eyes, then maybe not only could we understand why it is that they do those things, how it is that they see the world, but as I said, maybe the new hybridized self that we create out of ourselves, maybe that would be an option for living for them. Because if it's a true hybrid, we now become a kind of version of them. And if it's an attractive version, if it's something that offers them kind of an imaginative way of of rethinking themselves, then that might be an incremental step towards a more peaceful or more harmonious relationship. So I say that's actually a fairly radical thing to say, right? Um, But I wonder whether, and this is something that we can maybe um, discuss and, and explore a bit more together. Maybe it's a way forward. I'm not sure if there are any really strong other ways forward. As I say, we've been trying for a long time and it doesn't seem to be working very well. Um, so maybe I'll leave it, at, the, leave it with, uh, at that for you. It's a bit of a question and a challenge to think about. And uh, perhaps we can open it up for some discussion and questions. Yeah. Would it work if we are the only party that participates and those terrorists you spoke of? Yeah, they're not us? there. That's How a really good question. How do you repeat the question? I'll, I'll repeat the question, yeah. So if I've got your question right, you're really asking, look, if the reluctant other isn't in the room and they're not speaking for themselves, how is this going to work? How are we going to really authentically know their position, right? Well, uh, uh, thankfully, um, first of all, I agree with you. It is a very difficult thing to do. And it's not something that you can kind of just do once and you're good, right? Uh, if we're really going to try to understand the mind of people who want to harm us, you know, first of all, that's not a nice thing to try to do. And secondly, it may not be possible. But at the same time, I think human beings are um, almost illimitless or limitlessly imaginative. And we can do our homework. We can learn about their tradition and their history. We can learn about their societies and their cultures. We can learn about their identities and their economics and their politics. We can do our homework so that we've filled in as much of the context as we can. And then we have to use our imaginations. This is uh, one of the reasons why I think the arts, the humanities are so important because it's in those traditions or in those, those disciplines that we train our imaginations. Specifically, it's really, uh, you know, one of the greatest tools for that kind of imaginative rethinking are novels and literature on art and music. These are the ways we uh, bridge that gap. Now, it's not going to be perfect, absolutely. And actually, we don't want it to be perfect. We don't want to completely give ourselves over and convert, as it were, right? Especially if that position leads to abhorrent things. But we do want to get some indication, some understanding of that world. Unless we imagine them all to be insane, there must be some reason for the way they see the world. And we can imagine those reasons. We can imagine ourselves in that situation. So I think that this process is a really long one. It requires us to commit to understanding the other through a long process. And it's, in in the end, a kind of um, imaginative interpretation. All we ever get is a hybrid. We never get their view. We get that hybrid view, their view as seen by us, or our view as affected by them. That's all we ever get. But I want to suggest that maybe that's the increment that we need. And once that's more stable, when we might be able to make more increments and more and more and more, and slowly make some progress. Because otherwise, it's a war of all against all, and we never understand each other. And, you know, I've given you a very um, radical example, but this is stuff that happens all the time. 
When you meet somebody in your own family, in your own community, you are doing this already. In order to understand where they're coming from, in order to understand a conversation, you are already using what you know and trying to bring their perspective to bear on it. You are changing yourself through their perspective. And as you understand them, you create a kind of option for them to understand themselves through the relationship with you. This happens all the time. We're doing it all the time. So um, in your uh, introduction of, of your background, you alluded to your own kind of uh, hybrid nature. And, and um, you know, I submit that, that that's um, extremely widespread, almost universal. Absolutely. So, so um, you know, in alluding to the Canadian aspect, you mentioned that it's kind of Christian. Um, I mean, I think there's um, kind of uh, uh, one of the um, overlapses with uh, modernity or humanism or, you know, the liberal tradition. Um, and then another strong element, I think, is, is, is um, uh, technology. I mean, if just in this little time we spent together, you know, uh, Rabbi alluded to, to a website. Uh, we were having AV problems, um, uh, you know, phones sounding <laughs> off and all that. And, um, you know, that, that, those are very powerful forces, I mm -hmm. think. And, and so maybe overarching any kind of mm -hmm. um, interaction between religions is this kind of um, environment that we live in now that is very powerful. Absolutely. And you're quite right. I mean, uh, as I said, um, you know, the... Um, context in which I found myself in Canada um, is largely Christian, right? This is what the tradition in Canada is. And um, just like, again, fish don't understand they're in water, sometimes we don't really realize just how deep that Christianity is in our tradition. So again, to become kind of liminal, trying to be on the margins of something, sometimes that helps us to sort of see those underlying forces, those Christian presuppositions and categories that we habitually use. Um, we then know when we are not using them and when we are using them, when we are within our own tradition or when we are um, swimming in the broader stream. And that broader stream, as you mentioned, has lots of other factors. So technology, economics, um, uh, politics, all these sorts of things, you're quite right, they affect all of the ways in which these religions and, and engagements take place. But I want to propose to you something else. The idea of the secular sometimes is thought to be a kind of overarching umbrella, right? And all the religions are dealing within that tradition, within this secular sort of space. And that's one way to think about secularity. Um, if you've read uh, Charles Taylor's book, in the, the, in the Secular Age, it's a big, long book. Um, and uh, you, if you really want to just get to the crux of it, it's just the last few chapters that are really important. The rest is a lot of history. It's very important and interesting. But his, his thesis in that book is that the image of a, the secular umbrella under which all of these different traditions vie and... and um, uh, you know, compete with each other. That's one way of thinking about it. And it may not be the best way of thinking about the secular. What if we imagined the uh, Venn diagram to include all of the traditions that we see, religious and non-religious? That overlap, that connection, the overlap of all of them might be better thought to be the secular space, right? Because the idea of a secular umbrella makes us think that it's neutral, but it's clearly not neutral. The secular space in Canada is largely embedded uh, or imbued with Christianity. And as I say, it's hidden most of the time through all kinds of you know, dead metaphors and categories that we habitually use. But if we think about secularism, not as a kind of neutral umbrella, but as a kind of overlap space, right? Then we not only get rid of an illusion, but we also bring all of these overlap traditions to bear on the problems that we face. The secular space, as we typically think about it as neutral, means that, well, your religion is fine, but keep it to yourself. Don't bring it into politics. Don't bring it into the public square. 
And we're losing so much when we do that because our traditions historically are a tool in many ways, technologies, social technologies designed and developed to solve all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems. Our traditions are centuries, millennia long of human beings trying to sort out who am I? How do we deal with suffering? What's the best way to organize societies? What are the best ways to live our lives? Right? And so I think Taylor's way of suggesting, look, secularity could be this kind of multiple overlap of all these various traditions that brings to the table all of those resources from those traditions rather than saying, nice, nice tradition of yours, but keep it out of the public sphere. Sorry, it's a long answer to an interesting question. I hope that helps, though. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Uh, Uh, yeah, quite regularly. <laughs> and I think actually you probably do too. As I said, we do this all the time. And um, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, me talking to, you know, a terrorist who wants to, you know, get rid of us. Uh, although I have done that kind of stuff. And we've had dialogues using this kind of model uh, among, uh, with a student of mine among um, uh, terrorist um, uh, criminals in um, maximum security prisons in Britain. And so he and I have been working to try to operationalize some of this stuff. So we have done this. But I do it all the time with my wife. I have to constantly re-understand her, right? And in order to do so, I've got to take, imagine myself in her, in her shoes. I have to do this with my children. I have to do this with my students. I'm constantly trying to imagine myself in their worlds. And of course, I don't fully understand that, right? But it's an, an ongoing process, an ongoing dialogue, right? And uh, as if those of you who do have partners, you know what this ongoing dialogue <laughs> and this ongoing process is like. Uh, we regularly make mistakes uh, and even when we think we've totally understood them, they're still surprising us. So we are constantly liminalizing ourselves in order to understand those who are even closest to us. So I think most of us probably experience that. Yeah, my, my question really was the operational one, and speaking to the terrorists, yeah. you've got those people in a special place, and that's yeah. why you have access to them. Yeah. The difficulty is when they're not in that. That's right. That's right. So um, coming back to the question, so that the question was, um, how do you get to, the, to those really extreme examples? How do you talk to that? Well, you know, we've got a bunch of prisoners that we can speak to, their, their, their uh, captive audience. But what about those people who aren't there? Well, um, technology is actually quite helpful in this case, right? Because interestingly, those people are not secret about what they believe. So there's all kinds of literature, all kinds of stuff on the web. We can constantly be engaging with that aspect of things. And um, I, I do consult with some security issues for governments and, and for municipalities. And um, so when we operationalize with them, what we try to do is we do a form of, uh, we start with kind of a form of anthropology. We try to be observers and then participant observers in those communities. And when we've gained some trust, and some long story really about how we operationalize this stuff, uh, when we've gained a little bit of a foothold, then there is a kind of uh, process that we try to introduce. And it really relies on this kind of imaginative power of metaphor. Um, is it Andre Breton? Uh, a Dadaist uh, uh, painter in the early part of the 20th century said that it is by the power of images that real revolutions are made. And we try to incorporate or introduce metaphorical images. And when we can, we can at least hope that real revolutions in thinking can be made. So we have a process and, and some programs about training people's imaginations. And we use metaphor a lot. We use story a lot. Um, and it has had some success, I think. Um, 
you know, it's difficult to know because it's a long-term process. And can we say that, well, uh, this person who used to think really negatively about um, society now thinks much more positively because they're, they've been able to imagine themselves differently. Well, sometimes that happens. So within each circle, position one, position two, it's not as simple as that because you have high risk within the Absolutely. Yep, gets really complicated really quickly. <laughs> so within the traditions, there's also constant negotiation and hybridization. In any tradition, in any religious tradition, you know that there are, you know, sometimes you might call them factions, but at least different interpretations, right? And we are constantly negotiating our own hybrid identities within those traditions. So any time we try to do this, it's actually only ever kind of on a one-to-one -one basis, or at best kind of a group basis, how to turn it into a, a larger context is really a, a, a job that we still are trying to work out, right? And is the hybrid, does it become a fusion, or does it remain as a hybrid? Um, it kind of depends. You know, there's no um, uh, absolute path for it. Some hybrids do become kind of their own way of thinking about things. Um, now, I expect the first uh, Fader Interfaith fellow that I met, um, the Sikh uh, woman, uh, would probably disagree with me strongly. Uh, but there are some scholars who would suggest that Sikhism started out as a kind of amalgamation or hybrid between Islam and Hinduism. Right? Now, lots of scholars would say, no, that's not getting at the uniqueness of this Hybrid, uh, hybridization, and that's probably true as well. At the same time, we can look at the history and say, wait a minute, you can see elements of both traditions in this new tradition. The thing is, Sikhism became um, a tremendously attractive in that local area for lots of people. It became stronger and stronger and more real and real. And as it did so, it developed its own form of life, its own particular way of seeing the world, which did owe something to its parent traditions, but was unique enough and different enough that it grew into its own self, as it were. In the same way that our children share um, you know, uh, aspects of our, their parents, they eventually grow up and become their own people. Do they ever lose those characteristics that they got from their parents? Well, maybe not. Maybe that's always there in some way. But they have blended them in a new and particular and unique way, right? And they've become their own people. Sikhism and many new religious movements are the same. They develop in their own way. They eventually grow in strength. Um, they are attractive because they give us a possible option, a new way of thinking, a new way of living, which is very attractive to many people, right? So as it does so, it becomes more solidified, it becomes its own tradition, and now it's one of the world's religions. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I may be, but I, I come with the impression that um, a little like Judaism, Hinduism, uh, one of its dimensions is to help to divine the nation of, of um, Indians who speak, you know, and, and, and the official language among hundreds is Hindi, and it's all the same origin, so, so it's very ancient and, and rooted in, you know, the, the um, geography yes. and, and the kind of um, national aspirations of the people. And I see a similarity to Judaism. Absolutely, yep. Um, whereas a lot of times these kind of offshoots tend to be a little more universalistic, maybe be, just because they're more modern, perhaps, mm -hmm. I don't know. But um, I guess, um, is one of the tensions you have in that kind of situation, like take India or take Israel, is where you have a religion that maybe it's not declared the state religion or the multiple state religions, but still there's this aspect that somehow the national enterprise and the religion are linked. Yeah. And, and that can lead to its own problematic. Absolutely. I think you're, you're very right. Both Judaism and, and Hinduism started out primarily as ethnic or, or national religions, national traditions. And to a large extent, that's still true. The vast majority of Hindus in the world live in India. Of course, there is just about every religious tradition existent in India as well. And I expect that's the same 
case for Judaism, that the national religion of Israel, of course, is, is Judaism, uh, but there are other traditions there as well. And I'm not a historian, but what historians tell me is that this mixture, this plurality, has always been the case. So when we think that this is a particularly modern sort of thing, you're quite right. This kind of hybridization has become much more prevalent in the modern period, probably since about the 15 or 1600s. But I would argue, along with these historians, that it has always been the case that there have been mixtures because we've always lived among our religious others. And it may have been very small. This hybridization might have been really minuscule. But I think by just looking at the logic of it, it's reasonable to think that even thousands of years ago, there were hybrids. There may have been only a few. And they have to negotiate their identity in among the vast majority. And sometimes they were going to be hiding their identities in the vast majority. Right? Um, Again, I, I'm, I'm very, um, um, you know, looking forward and, um, you know, hoping, hopeful to learn more about Judaism and Jewish history. Uh, one of the things that I uh, uh, understand a little bit about is the um, history of Jews in Europe uh, who had to hide their identities and become, in some ways, at least on the surface, hybridized in some way. They, might have, they, may, they may have had to play a part, but I'm curious about their identities. Did playing a part affect who they were inside, or was it always really separate? Did they always just have a mask and then at home they were completely themselves, or did wearing that mask affect their version of their own tradition? Right. I'd be curious to understand, know if, if there's literature about that. And, and because I think that identity, the, way, the, the roles we play really do affect how we see ourselves. If, um, um, you know, the role I'm playing now, you know, is of a scholar or a speaker or whatever, um, not an expert, um, but, you know, somebody who's thinking about these things. That's a role that I've played for a long time in various contexts. And of course, it's kind of how I identify myself to some extent, in the same way that we identify ourselves as fathers or mothers or sisters, brothers, whatever. All the roles that we play are part of our identities, right? And so, again, all of that is to say that it's not necessarily a really modern phenomenon. I think it's a human phenomenon. We've just become, uh, it's become greater due to globalism, it's become greater due to communications. We know more about it, that kind of stuff. But I think it's always been happening. Yeah. I got distracted by your chaos and French thing. Yeah. So I'll leave that alone for now. It's a different idea of all that. But in terms of what you're doing know, the diagram and tradition one and tradition two and the hybrid tradition, uh, there's, a, there's um, a bedrock to that, that that's assumed that doesn't exist. And it's a precondition for that to occur. And what that is is mutual respect. Yeah. So without mutual respect, you're not gonna have the creation of a hybrid. And so we see hybrids in our own culture through assimilation, where now we have Christmaka or Hanukkah, where there are these new traditions yeah. occurring. But based, you know, that occurs as a result of mutual respect for each other's position and an appreciation of that. We don't have that mutual respect. Uh, you can't have a dialogue with someone who doesn't even recognize your right to exist. Yeah. So, you know, I'd like to know how we get there. How do we, you know, it'd be lovely to have hybrid traditions, but you can't have a hybrid tradition when one person wants to annihilate you. Sure. And, and that's, hear it on the streets. So that's the issue, as I said, that's the challenge um, for for us when we're dealing with the reluctant other, people who are not just reluctant, they're the terrorist other, there's the, the violent other. They, as you say, they don't respect us, they don't want to know us, they want to get rid of us. So here's the situation, we're in, we're in that situation, what do we do, yes. right? If there's no respect, uh, well, it becomes, it, it gets devolved, I think, to politics and economics and bureaucracy. 
our engagement with those people. Either we just turn our backs and we never engage, but that's not really possible in this world, especially with bad actors. We have to engage with them because they're forcing themselves on us. So how do we do that? Well, as I say, it devolves, it tends to devolve to politics, economics, power, uh, those kinds of things. And, you know, the question is, how's that been going for us, right? It's been going on for a long time, that way of dealing with uh, these, these um, um, other people, other traditions and cultures. Um, it hasn't been working out perfectly. It has had some good things, right? It's not as though it's a complete failure. But we still get to the situation where in order to make some incremental movement towards something better, somebody's got to take, uh, somebody's going to have to take the first step. And my suggestion is that as people of goodwill, as people who want to see peace, as people who want harmony and understanding, it might require a sacrifice on our part to move towards them when they don't want anything to do with us. Now, I think that's actually not something that requires heroism. It's not something that only, you know, uh, Gandhi and, and, you know, saints can do, you know, the rabbis of old. That's not, that's not true. I think it's something that we're all asked to do by the traditions themselves. We are supposed to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of the other. And in religious traditions, we see this all the time. Even in secular philosophy, there are strains of thought and argument that suggest in order to avoid holocausts, in order to avoid genocides, the people who are remaining have to move and sacrifice themselves for the sake of the other. Um, one of my favorite philosophers is Emmanuel Levinas, uh, a Jewish philosopher um, and um, um, a survivor. Uh, and not using any traditional religious sources, his argument is that in ethics, we have a non-reciprocal responsibility. We have responsibility for the other, but we cannot expect them to have responsibility for us. If we don't do that, then it always becomes transactional. And what he's trying to do is say, we have to live in a non-transactional way. Just as God gives us as much of the blessings and, and grace uh, in a non-transactional way. We can never hope to repay God. So the traditions themselves show this. We see it in Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism. All of the traditions that I've studied have this idea. So it's a sacrifice. And in um, um, Christianity, at least, um, the term that's used is called kenosis. It literally means self-emptying. And I just came across the... Uh, Hebrew term, I think this is right, tell me if I'm wrong, simsum, that's simsum, this is the space that God opens up in himself for the sake of creation, is that fair? It's a contraction. Contraction, yeah. So it's a kind of, sorry? And contraction. So the idea is that for us to exist, for creation to be there, God had to sacrifice some of himself or herself. God had to contract God's own being. So I think I see similar ideas in other traditions. Levinas gives us a rather other reason, a secular argument for this. We don't have to be religious in order to follow his, his argument. So I don't think I've satisfied your, your question. <laughs> It is a long process, yeah, I, I, it may well. Um, but I'm totally open to other options. <laughs> I'm not sure if I've got a response or, or an answer to this. Here's just one way of thinking about it, and it might give us that tiny increment and another tiny increment, and it might take too long, and it might not be uh, terribly helpful or possible. But as I say, it's, I think, a better option than a war of all against all. 
in which we battle this out in the realms of power and politics and economics? Because that just doesn't seem to be working for us. You had a point, and then Shal. Well, yeah, I, was, I, I mean, I'm not sure this is responsive, but I'm not. Um, I, I think you can um, uh, kind of have a, a consciousness um, of uh, the other and, and try to understand more um, uh, that other tradition and, and how things fit in and how there's been ebbs and flows in that other tradition at times of, that were more tolerant and times that are less tolerant and, and things like that. And I think that, that um, if anything, that should be empowering. Uh, not, uh, doesn't mean that you have to, to be submissive or resign yourself to um, uh, basically being overrun or, or you, I mean, you can fight back where necessary, but uh, I don't think that the, just reacting by kind of uh, retreating to your own tradition or what you view as, as the purity of your tradition and, and, and having like a stark alterity of them and us will lead to any kind of resolution. One thing we can say about sacrifice, it may end up requiring physical sacrifice, but the first sacrifice and the one I'm asking for is a sacrifice of our ideas, sacrifice of our certainties, a sacrifice of our imaginations. We can at least think differently, right? And that might help, at least as a, a first step. So I want, I want to thank you for this uh, enlightening presentation, which in hindsight, I should have had you come for the first lecture, <laughs> and we should have started on this snippet. Yes. I think it would have been very helpful, but uh, be it as it may, here we are in our fifth year exploring this and, and looking back now on some of this. What, uh, what strikes me uh, are several things. First of all, uh, to address the, the point that was just being talked about, I think there's, there's interim stages. In other words, one doesn't simply just all of a sudden today now Let's engage the terrorists. Yeah. I mean, I think the whole point of this program is let's engage people who are willing to yeah. engage us. So it's not this false polarization of Jews versus radical terrorists who want to kill us all. Yeah. So we either we have to kill them or they'll kill us. So the interim is to say, what is Islam? What is Islam? And who in this large billion plus conglomerate of people call themselves Muslims can we begin a conversation with? And so we, we did that. We did that. Um, not that we completed it, but we, we, we began that process. Of Doing our homework. We, we started to do our homework and we engaged people and we're engaging people, which is why I was talking about this uh, uh, Calvary Herald uh, piece um, because it, it allowed me, because of relationships, to say to this body, great, you, you went this far, but, but the, the circles didn't overlap because you left out the Jewish piece here. And we've been talking about this, and so I bring that back into the kind of consciousness of the, the, the conversation. So basically, we're, we're engaging with... Um, just to take it into those two communities, the Muslim community, people who are willing to talk to us, and so we begin that process with those people. Eventually, my, my thinking is that if we're successful in expanding that, then you have a significant element of the Muslim world that has changed as we have changed. Absolutely. And then the people who are on the extremes then are now marginalized or they're, they're co-opted into this uh, conversation by necessity. So it's not going between us now and terrorists, it's between us and people of good faith in another community, goodwill, who are willing to begin that hard work. And I think that's the promise of this type of a program, which my, my, my dream would be that it's replicated in other communities, that they go out and do the same kind work that we're doing here. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I, I would point out um, as I was looking at the diagram, so the conservative movement itself was predicated upon this whole model. Mm -hmm. It said, here's Judaism of the Orthodox, you use the word ossified, mm -hmm. so 
this orthodoxy was was a was a, a black and white world, and the conservative, the, the the emerging conservative leaders in the 1800s saw that's not a model that's realistic in this world, and so they had this uh, Christianity secularism and Judaism, and that sort of hybrid was the conservative movement essentially, a recognition of. That, that somehow our Judaism has to be lived out and adapted into this complex world. The, the last thing I was thinking of is how people who are on the, on the extremes in the, or in the religion or who are the most um, fundamentalist, if you will, don't see this model at all. And they, they to their um, detriment and to to their um, ability to survive, they perpetuate that. So they want people like us to think that they're authentic, that they have really the fundamental, the true way of Judaism. When in fact, they also live in that same <coughs> way. Yeah. They're hybrids because they use modern technology. I mean, I get the slickest stuff that comes out in our community, the slickest programs and advertising is not by the conservative movement, it's not by the reform movement, it's not by the JCC. It comes from Brooklyn. They have Madison Avenue sending out this stuff. When you get those materials, those are like top tier stuff. No, I don't know. I've never been to any of the programs. You might want to. I don't generally have the time, but uh, or the interest, quite honestly. But 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 I should. You're right, because what I can discover, I suspect, is a tremendous disparity between the Madison Avenue and what's actually being taught on the ground. Because the Madison Avenue, if you look at the Madison Avenue. It's always these nice looking people who remotely look Jewish. You never see a kippah. And then what's being taught is a whole different uh, kind of thing. Anyway, my point being is, is that they position themselves in a very interesting way. And I think it's kind of illuminating for us to, to, to look at this model and realize they're doing the same thing we're doing actually in, in the world. They just don't want anyone to catch on to it. Yeah, we're so, all hybrids already. We're all hybrids. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for those comments. First of all, you're quite right. This is not, I'm not proposing that, you know, next year you invite, you know, somebody who's to kill you to, to come and, and talk. <laughs> of course, we have to go slowly. It's a long process. And um, one of the real benefits, I think, of doing this in the ways that you guys are doing it is that we do train your imaginations. And it takes a lot of training and a lot of homework to get to that position where you can get to that final point where, OK, now I think we understand enough of Islam. We understand and are strong enough in ourselves, having gone through all of this dialogue, we know who we are, too. This is now our chance to take a tiny step to make ourselves slightly a, a different option for them, as you said. If um, uh, if this group, if this uh, this congregation is speaking to one sector of Islam and maybe another sector of Islam and more and more and more, those people who don't want to talk, you're right, they get marginalized. But the interesting thing is, they might it might not be a matter of okay, well we're just squeezing them out. What we're kind of doing is giving them another option for seeing themselves. Right? They might say, wait a minute. I don't want to be marginalized. I want to be like them. I see benefits there. And so I kind of assume that human beings want the best for themselves. If we can provide new options for living, then it's a possibility to bring them in to the fold. Right? And um, yeah, it's, it's fairly obvious. My presuppositions are, you know, I want some more harmony. I want more peace. Um, I don't want as much violence. Uh, and if we can move towards that, then we should. Right? This is one way we can do it. Um, I think it has some benefits over the merely political and merely economic. Yeah. But see, um, somebody, um, somebody mentioned the thought that uh, um, 
so, so we'll dialogue with people who want to, are willing to dialogue with us, and then also maybe we can even learn about extremes because there, there um, uh, are more and more people who have become uh, disaffected with the extreme, but we're on the inside. So, you know, there are ex neo Nazis who speak on the topic and ex uh, ISIS people and things like that. They may have insights, I don't know, into what kind of goes into that. The people we talk to the prisons are very much. So I'll give, I'll give you an example of this. So as a result of this Jewish-Muslim dialogue that we've had among clergy and imams for over two years, we finally got to a very interesting development. So we never talked about the Middle East, talked about all sorts of other things, developed friendships, we could laugh, we could talk about various things. And then uh, a couple of us uh, rabbis were invited to participate in the Al-Quds rally. Now I thought that was incredibly naive and uh, borderline humorous uh, in the sense that had they really understood what they were asking of us, they would never have even sent the email. You said the wrong thing, you stop me. Uh, yeah, well, okay. So here's the point. So in, in the ensuing in responses, what became clear is they disassociated the couple of us rabbis from being Zionists. So the rally was against Zionism, um, pro-Palestinian against Zionism. So I said, this would be a great topic for our next meeting. So at the next meeting, we talked about Zionism. So we asked them, what, what, what do you understand Zionism to be? And then we shared what we thought Zionism was. But it was done without any defensive posture. Nobody took up any official positions. There was no um, exaggerated uh, uh, volume in our voices or anything else. It was a very civil and, and uh, conversation where people actually listened to each other. And the result was they now understood how we understood Zionism and why their assumption that we weren't Zionists, we were they're just their Jewish brothers and sisters, was inaccurate. But they also, one of the imams said to me, well, how do I voice my opposition to the Netanyahu government? Without using all the Zionist rhetoric and so forth. Sorry, how he should? How he could, yeah, how, how he should do that. Given the fact that now, what I was communicating to him about Zionism was not uh, a, a way to, to, to express himself. So my response was, well, you do it the same way I do it. <laughs> you just say, I'm against this policy, or I disagree with this position, or so forth. You don't undermine the entire legitimacy of the Jewish state and the, and the Jewish people in the process. So any of it, that was, was, was forward progress. That, that doesn't come when you stand across the street from someone with a sign and yell at them. I'm not saying there's not times when that's not appropriate, but what I'm saying is that will never move the ball anywhere and it won't engage people in that kind of conversation in which, you know, ultimately you can, you can um, see your way clear to a new path. You know? So um, there's some benefits of this. We're not talking with people who are extremists. We're talking about people who uh, lead their communities, everyday life, just as rabbis do in the Jewish community. So the, the, these models, I think, are really quite productive and, and uh, have some, uh, some possibilities here. The reason I, I brought up a fairly extreme example <clears throat> is because it helps us to isolate some of the presuppositions that are in. When we don't talk, people, or when we don't think through these extremes, we don't necessarily see all of the features of the way we already think and the way we can think. So you might consider it purely as a thought experiment, right? rather than a call to arms or a call to dialogue. Um, it might simply be as a thought experiment to think about how it is that we understand how we interpret the other. I'm sure the rabbi would be surprised that, you know, when I agree with him in the sense that you know, we're not going to make any progress with the extremes. It will, it will never happen. It's impossible. 
but we are too few number. We need to build bridges with those who do respect us, with those who will listen to us, with those who will try and understand us. And it's through them, they will be the conduits of the message that we need to get across, because they will shoot the messenger if it is us. So we certainly need allies. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the, and this is a need, and this is a, a method to do that. That's, right. that's exactly what I was going to suggest. Is that that's the dialogue that we're trying to have, um, as the rabbi suggested, we might be able to change the center's mind in certain ways, so that within that group, the margins see the center differently, and maybe see specifically on Zionism. It's a great example. If the center understands Zionism differently, then the margins are going to see their own brothers and sisters thinking differently. And that might be a way that this kind of dialogue um, affects the extreme. Yeah, I think uh, uh, for those of us who kind of live in the hybrid space where um, um, I'll call it just uh, modernity is kind of um, uh, part of the, the, the equivalent, I, I, it's probably seen like two or three um, uh, Indian American films on the son who won't marry the Indian girl, wants to marry, you know, a, a blonde goddess or something like that, which is, you know, that, that could just, you could just as easily see a Jewish you know, movie on exactly the same topic. And I think probably the kind of you know, living in the modern world and, and, and the dynamics that that the challenges that that presents in trying to maintain any kind of religious identity um, is something that is probably shared to a much higher extent than you know we maybe realize. I agree. I've got, I've got one other example that the men will uh, thank you wrap up today. So the, the, the Jewish Muslim example isn't the only one. Uh, as an example, we had Casey Eagle speaker here, and we're talking about gay spirituality. A lot of that comes out of their, their relationship to the earth, to the land. And that repeatedly, that was a theme. So, uh, not this year, but next year, because uh, we're going to be using all of our sukkah for a, a big sukkah festival out here. But the following year, we're, in, we're developing a program at St. Mary's where we're going to put a sukkah out wow. and next to a teepee. Wow. And we're going to have a conversation and a program talking about the environment, the land, from our religious perspectives. So here's another kind of way in which those circles sort of come overlapping. You know, you get the hybrid. No, we're not going to have, we're not trying to create Jewish, indigenous spirituality or something. But again, it, it allows us to think or to see how other people think, which influences us in terms of how we think. And so there, there's, there's innumerable ways to do that uh, with imagination and mm -hmm. creativity. Yeah. I think ritual and art and uh, literature, all of those things, sometimes are the best ways we can actually kind of engage in this kind of stuff. Any last questions? Or it's not a question, it's a statement. Sitting here in the group, sitting on and having a wonderful speaker come in the face of attention and things. I was sitting here and saying that two things. One, all we are is a field of possibilities beyond our religious beliefs and our traditions. However, and wherever we belong, for whatever reason, this may not be explained as to why I'm really sitting here. That the reality that we really have is way different than the reality we think we have. And to know that in every breath there is a possibility for something wonderful or whatever is going on. And one thing that I always look at to is wrong, but I can't help but think of what's happened in my own life as a child of survivors of the Holocaust as a teacher, as an artist, as a woman of many different disciplines. But what happened in my life when synchronicity brought me together with Swami Vivekananda <coughs> And I would encourage, as we have some Jewish meditation, 
and this Hindu meditation, and is one of the important strengths for the mind, the body, and spirit, that much of what we are talking about will definitely transform enormously if every human being, in whatever tradition they would talk, because every, every one of the great religions has it in how to sit still. Because when we pray, we talk to the divine. But when we meditate, the divine in nature talks to us. We make space as we're speaking of Sim Sun. And that's all we Wonderful. So we continue on the <coughs> schedule if I may just take a quick peek. So we're going to, going to invite you. One of, the, one of the nice things, of course, about the Scholar Residence Program is that we try to reach all the different demographics in the congregation. So Dr. Burrell is going to have an opportunity to meet our, our middle school kids. And if he survives that, uh, we'll continue on with a series of uh, lectures. Uh, I'm not sure where we are with the Diwali Festival yet. I still have Okay, we're, gonna, we're, we're working on that one. But uh, we're going to start a series of lectures. So please put the dates uh, in November on your uh, uh, calendar. And then we start with specific um, learning about Hinduism on October the 22nd. Uh, Hinduism 101 passed through the board. So please mark all these dates on your calendar. We look forward to uh, seeing you uh, continue with our studies. Thanks. Have a great day, everybody.